This set of 12 tapes on the book of Matthew was taught by Dr. Howard C. Estep of World Prophetic Ministry, Incorporated, Colton, California. On this tape, you will hear Dr. Estep discussing Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse 12 through chapter 22, verse 14. That is side one. Then on side two, Matthew 22, 15 through chapter 23, verse 12. Let us now go to the new auditorium of World Prophetic Ministry and listen to Dr. Estep teaching the book of Matthew. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 21, beginning with verse 12. This is our 17th lesson in the book of Matthew, and we're talking about the gospel of the king. The whole book of Matthew is talking about a king coming from heaven, and he's going to reign on this earth for a period of 1,000 literal years. Now, that's what Matthew's all about. In this particular lesson, we're dealing with Matthew 21, beginning with verse 12, through chapter 22, and conclude with verse 14. The title of our lesson, The King Exerts Authority. The king exerts authority. We have a key verse in 21 verse 22. The key verse says, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. The purpose of our lesson is that the believer may rely completely upon the Holy Scriptures as God's complete authority in all matters pertaining to life and death. We have a lesson outlined for you. It's in five parts. Part one, Christ cleanse the temple. That's chapter 21, verses 12 through 16. The second point, a demonstration of faith. Chapter 21, verses 17 through 22. Point three, Jesus deals with his critics. It's interesting to see how he is going to deal with his own personal critics. Those who didn't like him, those who were constantly trying to trip him. Our fourth point deals with two parables. The first parable is the two sons. Then the second parable would be the householder. This is verses 28 through 46. In the third part where Jesus deals with his critics, that's verses 23 through 27. The fourth one, the two parables, the two sons, the householder, verses 28 through 46 And that concludes chapter 21. And then our concluding part in this lesson is the parable of the marriage feast, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Let's proceed with our lesson in Matthew 21, beginning with verse 12. And we shall read, and this is what it says. When Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Now this is the second cleansing of the temple. The first was in John chapter 2 beginning with verse 13. When he cleansed the temple the first time, this is the second cleansing. And you'd have to have gone over to that part of the world and Visualize what the temple is all about. It was the center of all types of worship in Israel at that particular time. And so there were men sitting in the courtyard of the temple at tables, and they were selling doves, which were sacrificed. They were making change because people came with foreign money. The money had to be converted. Because at that particular time, a half shekel, about 32 cents, had to be paid by every Jew on the 15th day of March. So there was a tribute money that had to be paid. So these men are sitting there, 
and they are called money changers. And the first time I went to Israel, I was rather shocked when I walked down the streets of old Jerusalem and I saw big signs, money changers. That's exactly what they are. They change your money for a fee. And this money changing had become such a process in the temple in verse 12 that Jesus went in and he disrupted the whole thing. Verse 13, and he said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. One of the translations says a den of merchandise. They had commercialized in the house of God. So much so that Jesus Christ was infuriated with it. And so he was prone to turn over the tables of the money changers and bring about a change in the whole affair. Now we proceed to verse 14, and we're still looking at Christ cleansing the temple. This is verse 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. First of all, he got their attention. Because here they are about ready to have a service and the crowd is going in and they're visiting the money changers. They're doing this, that, and the other thing. Then he comes in and he turns over the tables and he cleanses the temple. He drives out these commercial con artists and he got the attention. And so then in verse 14, the blind and the lame begin to come to him and the Bible says he healed them. Every one of them, he healed them. Verse 15, and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. The chief priests and the scribes were displeased because here's a man coming on their very premises and he's gaining attraction. He's beginning to become popular. These scribes and Pharisees, you see, they had just come through 400 years of silence. There hadn't been a prophet in Israel since the days of Malachi, and for 400 years there had been complete silence. And so there appears on the the scene a man who has tremendous power. He's able to heal people. He walks into the very center of religious authority and he turns over the money tables. He puts a whip in his hand and he starts uh, bringing about a militant justice among those people and he causes havoc. He gets attention. He becomes a center of attraction. And so these chief priests and scribes are very much perplexed about this whole situation, because in verse 16, and said unto him, hearest thou what these say? Do you hear what all of these people are saying? Up in verse 15, they were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were greeting him as though he was a tremendous person. And so the scribes say to him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, yes, yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. Even the infants were to praise him. In one place it says that even the stones could be commanded to cry out and praise him if necessary because he had all power. Christ cleansed the temple. In our second point, a demonstration of faith, we begin with verse 17 through 22 and it says in the 17th verse, and he left them. He got all of them he wanted. He left them and went out of the city into Bethany. Now, Bethany is about two miles away or a little bit less. So he leaves Jerusalem, the temple, on Mount Moriah, and he goes out of the city, goes over to Bethany. This is verse 17. And he lodged there. The notes I have tell me something I'd never thought of before, but Jesus really never spent a whole night in the city of Jerusalem. He always went out of the city. 
He frequented the home of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary oftentimes. In fact, when you visit that part of the world, they will show you a probability of a house that could have been similar to the house of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And they had what they called a prophet's room upstairs, just a small room. And this could have very well been a room that was fitted out by Lazarus, Martha, and Mary that was used exclusively by Jesus. Verse 18, he returned into the city, and as he was going into the city, he hungered. He hadn't had breakfast, evidently. He became very hungry, or he was conscious of his hunger. And then in verse 19, it says, And when he saw a fig tree in the way, as he was going along the pathway from Bethany over to Jerusalem, he saw a fig tree by the pathway, and he came to the tree and found nothing thereon. Now, that fig tree is much like the lemon tree that we have in our backyard. There are lemons on that tree 12 months a year. Now, sometimes during the year has more lemons than it does other times. So fig trees had figs on them the year round if they weren't picked. So he comes along expecting to get a fig off of the tree. What does it say? And he found nothing there on the middle of verse 19. He found nothing on it, no figs but leaves only. Am I right? There's a lesson. I've heard Sunday morning sermons preached on this many times. In fact, there's a, there's a song, Only Leaves. He was expecting fruit, but he got just leaves. Modern Christianity, very little fruit, just leaves. Big show. Oh, big deal, but no fruit. So when he went to the tree, no fruit, just leaves. And he said unto the tree, now he talked to the tree. After all, he's the creator of the tree to start with in the first place. And he said unto the tree, let no fruit grow on thee, hence forward forever. Now he didn't curse all the fig trees. He cursed just one tree. One tree, and presently the fig tree withered away. That's a miracle. That was a miracle right from the lips of the Son of God because when he examined the tree and there was no fruit there, only leaves, he cursed it, he put a curse up on it, and it withered immediately. And verse 20 says, And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away. Almost within the space of just a few minutes, this thriving, beautiful, green, foliaged fig tree begins to wither away. Now, what's the point here? It's a demonstration of faith. It's carrying out the title of our lesson, The King Exerts His Authority. Now, some people come along and say, well, why would he do a thing like that? Who am I to question him? It's his tree. He can do what he wants to with it. And there's no point here in trying to make this the Jewish nation any more than you would make a, a sassafras tree uh, a Gentile nation. And it's amazing how some preachers and some writers try to twist everything into a prophetic situation. There's no prophetic situation here. He's going down the street, down the pathway. He sees a tree. He thinks it's a fig tree. It is. And normally fig trees have figs on them. He reaches for a fig. There's no fig. And he said, cursed be on you from now forever. You'll never have another fig on you as long as you live and the thing withered away within the space of the time that they were there on that spot. Tremendous power, a demonstration of faith, meaning to say that if we have faith to believe in God, God can bring to pass every desire of our hearts 
providing those desires are according to the will of God. I don't care what they are. You're sitting in a monument of faith at this very hour. A year and a half ago, this did not exist. It's here because one man, surrounded by believing Christians of like mind, persevered and believed that God could do it and God has done it. Verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, we're showing you a uh, demonstration of faith. If you have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Verse 22. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Now some people have the idea that they can cast mountains into the sea. There's no point. That would be ridiculous. To go out here to a hill and say, I believe that I I can have you removed. There's no point. The Bible doesn't emphasize that. The Bible doesn't say just because we believe that we're going to have the ability to go out and do heavenly excavations. It doesn't say that. Or put heavy machinery operators out of business. There's no point there. The Bible is emphasizing that if we have faith and we believe and we're willing to put our faith into action, that we can do the impossible if we want to. And many of you have testified to me personally that in your own life you have seen miracle after miracle transformed and become a reality. And some of you are in this auditorium at this hour because... God has performed a miracle in your own life physically or you wouldn't even be able to be here. Jesus deals with his critics. This has to do with verses 23 through 27. And this is quite interesting. I like the way he deals with his critics because if you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to have critics. The lady who lives next door to you will become a critic in all probability. Somebody that you work with will become a critic. If you are a true, born-again, Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-directed believer, you can't help but have a critic or critics. How are you going to deal with them? And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests, this is after he had put the curse on the fig tree, He came into the temple, and the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching. And they said, because they're the religious leaders, you know. They're the ones that are ordained. They're the ones that have been through the seminary. They're the ones who had been given permission to teach Judaism. They were the ones who wore the robes, the long robes, and had their hands in the cuffs, you know. And they stood on the corner of the street and they prayed long prayers audibly so people could hear them. They're the religious leaders. So they come to him and they say to him, By what authority? Where did you get your authority to to teach like this? And who gave thee this authority? Show us your ordination papers. Which denomination sent you out to do this? Who gave you the authority to do this? Verse 24. And Jesus answered and said unto them. I love this. It's a classic. Listen. He said unto them, I also will ask you a question. You were asking me a question. Give me the same privilege. I'll ask you a question. One thing which if ye tell me. I, and likewise, will tell you by what authority I do these things. And this was one of his patterns that he always used. They would ask him a question, then he would ask them a question. Watch what happened. Verse 25. 
The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? Then they had a little committee meeting, got together, began to talk it over, swap ideas back and forth, middle of verse 25, and they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? Verse 26, If we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. Verse 27, And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. We don't know. Translated in our modern language, We do not know. You'd think they have more intelligence than that. Simple little question. John the Baptist, he came baptizing in the wilderness. Was it of heaven? Was it of men? Was it of God? Was it of men? If you went to the high muckety-muck of some religious denomination today and you asked him a simple little question like that, you'd expect Dr. Help All of Us to give you an answer. But they couldn't. And they said unto him, We cannot tell. And then he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. (laughs) He's right back where he started. I'm not going to tell you. You don't tell me. I don't tell you. Jesus deals with his critics. Two parables. This has to do with verses 28, and we're looking through verse 46. Two parables. The first one, two sons. Verse 28. But what think ye... A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and he said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. Verse 29, he answered and said, I will not. Quite an obedient son, wasn't he? I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. Verse 30, and he came to the second son and he said likewise, And the second son answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. He promised him, but he didn't do it. The first one said, no. Then he thought it over, realized he had spoken too quick, repented, went to work. Second one, oh, yes, Dad, I'll be happy to. Have you ever seen people like that? You want them to do something? Oh, don't worry, we'll do it. Watch this, verse 31. Whether of them twain, which of the two, it says, did the will of his father? They say unto him, the first. He's talking to the religious leaders. The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. He's talking to the religious leaders. And he's saying to the religious leaders, The publicans and the harlots of Jerusalem, of Israel, will go into the kingdom of God before you. They have a better chance of being saved than you do. Why? Well, let's look and see. This is what it says in verse 32. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. John the Baptist came as a righteous man of God, teaching and preaching and baptizing and urging people to repent of their sins and be saved, and they refused to believe him. Middle of verse 32, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. These two boys, one said, no, I won't. Then he changed his mind. He went to work. The other son said, oh, yes, Dad, don't worry a thing about it. I'll get it done. I'll have the lawn mowed, Dad, before 10 o'clock. Don't worry a thing about it. And Dad comes back later, and the mower is still in the garage. Nobody's taking it out to do anything with it. The guy's gone off down to the pool room. You see... If we promise somebody to do something, do it. 
If we make a covenant with God and our fellow man, do it, if it's possible, within your physical framework to do it. God will bless you for it. And which of the two were in the will of God? The first one. Because he repented of his wrongdoing, and as he repented, he immediately took up where he should have started in the first place. So we have here, in this section of Scripture, beginning with verse 28, the two sons, the first parable. We move to the second parable, and this is in verse 33, and this is what it has to say. And it deals with the parable of the householder. It's an interesting parable. Verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard, and he hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower. That tower could have been a temporary structure, or it could have been a stone tower that was a permanent structure out in the middle of the vineyard, because in that stone tower was room for a man or even a small family to live. They cook their meals, they sleep there, they watch the vineyard to keep robbers away and to keep wild animals from coming in and destroying the grapes. So he planted a vineyard, built a wine press, built a tower, and then he rented it out to the husbandman, and then he went into a far country. Verse 34, And when the time of the fruit grew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman, that they might receive the fruits of the vineyard. Verse 35. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one, and killed another, and stoned the third. That's a pretty rough reception. Verse 36. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. He sent a bigger contingent of servants back to the vineyard, And they did unto them likewise. They roughed them up. Gave them the going over. Gave them the mafia treatment. Those boys weren't willing to come back anymore. Look at verse 37. This is what it says. But last of all, he sent unto them his son. He was sending the... Actually, this is a a picture of how God dealt with the world. He sent the prophets, major and the minor prophets. They were all killed. They were stoned. They didn't listen to them. And finally, verse 37, And then at last he sent unto them his son, saying, They will respect my son. They'll reverence him. Verse 37, They'll reverence him. Verse 38, But when the husbandman saw the son, what happened? Evil thoughts began to take place in his mind, and they said among themselves, this is the heir. This is the fellow that's going to inherit this whole vineyard. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. Once we kill him, then we'll own the whole vineyard. Now watch it. It gets really interesting. Verse 39. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Verse 40. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Verse 41. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. What's it a picture of? It's a parable. A parable is an earthly story having a heavenly meaning. What's he saying? That the Jews had the gospel before the Gentiles ever thought about having it. For 1,500 years, God dealt with the Jews through the Mosaic Law and the Mosaic Covenant. They turned their backs upon him. The Jews had the opportunity. I believe the Bible teaches that God doesn't continually give people an opportunity to live for him. God doesn't continually 
give the unbeliever an opportunity to be saved, that there comes a day when that day of grace ceases. Now, I'm not saying that the day of grace is the same for everybody. God may extend his day of grace longer, individual grace, with an individual one longer than the other. The Jews had their opportunity. They slew John the Baptist, cut off his head. They slew the son, Jesus Christ. They chased him up one of the hills of Asia Minor. And the Jewish leaders of that day cried out to the Roman authorities. They said, crucify him and let his blood be upon us and our children. And that's exactly what has happened. And then God gave the vineyard to somebody else. Did you notice that? In verse 41, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. And for 1,900 years, the Gentiles have been tending the vineyard. The Gentiles have been taking the gospel to the four corners of the world, not the Jews, the Gentiles. Look at verse 42. It's quite interesting. Jesus saith unto them, Did you ever or did you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 43, this is what it says. Therefore, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, from the Jews, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Verse 44. And whosoever shall fall on this stone, who endeavors to harm this stone, talking of himself, shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it, this stone, will grind that individual to powder. You can't mess around with God. It's all the way with Jesus Christ or nothing. I'm watching some of the popular, recently converted Big name Christians. If they're playing around with God, my friends, that stone will grind them to powder. Because he doesn't play fast and loose. It's with God all the way or nothing. Looking at verse 45. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. Well, I would think so, dummies. You'd think they'd wake up after a while, wouldn't you? Verse 46, But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. And he was. He was a prophet sent of God. The two parables, the two sons, the householder. The concluding section, the parable of the marriage feast, uh, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. And this is what it has to say, beginning with verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Verse 3. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden or invited to the wedding, and they would not come. He made a big feast. He was ready for them. They wouldn't come. Verse 4, this is what it says. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. It's ready. My oxen and my fatlings are all killed, and all things are ready. I've got this feast. Everything is ready. Get the people to come. Come unto the marriage. Verse 5. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his store, merchandise. Verse 6. 
And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Verse 7. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, very angry. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Verse 8. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. Verse 9. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid or invite to the marriage. Go out into the hedges in the highways, and as many as you can find, everybody, invite them to the marriage. It's a parable. It's going on. Watch it. Look at verse 10. This is what it says. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, both saved and unsaved. And the wedding was furnished with guests. He's talking about the marriage supper. What's the purpose of the church? What's the purpose of this ministry? Invite people to come to Jesus Christ. Tell them that all things are ready. Get ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb, both good and bad. Don't worry about a fellow if he has a bad habit or an evil habit. When he comes to the judgment of his works, that will all be taken care of. Look at verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on the wedding garment. In the eyes of God, we all look alike. There's no group that's more esteemed than another group. We're all there by the shed blood of the Son of God. By grace. By faith by the application of the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. We'll all look alike. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man who had not on the wedding garment. Verse 12. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou hither, not having a wedding garment? And this man was speechless. This fellow was just speechless. He didn't know what to say. Verse 13. Notice what it says. Then the king said to the servants, Bind this fellow that doesn't have on a wedding garment, bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 14, For many are called, but few are chosen. What's he saying? We have here the marriage feast or the parable of the marriage feast. And in this parable, we have the great worldwide international invitation that's going out to every living creature to receive Christ as their Savior. Now, people come to me and they say, but mystery step, everybody doesn't hear the gospel. That's true. But everybody has the law of God written in their hearts. Everybody. You can go to the darkest place on the continents of this world and you will find some measure of law and order among the very primitive people. And everybody knows it's wrong to steal. It's written in their hearts. People know this. It's the law of God that's been written in the hearts of people. So the universal invitation is going out for people to repent of their sins, believe Jesus Christ, and get ready for the coming of the Lord. That's why the Bible says, Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time. He's coming the second time. And this parable of the feast, of the wedding feast, is a worldwide invitation to everybody to come to the marriage feast of the Lamb. And that's what's going on. 
Our churches, packed and jammed, they tell us some 69 to 70 million people in America are church members. There's no point in me preaching a sermon and trying to show you how many of those people aren't saved. Because at the time of the translation of the church, when Jesus Christ comes, he's only taking those who have on the wedding garment. You notice one of the fellows didn't have on the wedding garment? He said, how come you in here? No wedding garment. How come you got in here? And then the man says, take him and bind him, hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and, and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is removed from this sin-plagued earth one of these days, those left behind are going to realize that the light of this world is gone, the salt of this world, which is the preserving force, is gone, and there's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and mental frustrations, the like of which this world has never experienced. And we are moving gradually into that era. The king exerts his authority. One, Christ cleansed the temple. He had the authority to do it. Two, demonstration of faith. No fruit on the fig tree, so he curses it. Three, Jesus deals with his critics. You don't tell me what I ask of you, then I don't tell you what you ask of me. Four, two parables, the parable of the two sons, the one who defied his father and said, not me. Then he realized he'd been an unfaithful son. He repented. He went to work. The other one said, oh, yes, dad, don't worry. I'll mow the lawn this morning. You go on. Don't worry. I'll take care of everything. I'll even clean out the garage. I'll sweep the driveway. I'll help mom get in the stove. Well, don't worry, dad. I'm your good son. I'll handle everything. It's the repentant sinner that gets the job done. The self-righteous fellow never gets anything done. The two sons and then the householder, where the householder finally sent his son, the heir, and they ganged up on the heir and they slew him thinking that they would have the whole thing. And then we conclude our lesson with the parable of the marriage feast. There's going on a worldwide invitation to invite everybody to come to the marriage feast of the Lamb. One of these days, the trumpet will sound, the heavens will split, the Son of God will come down from glory. We'll be caught up in a moment of time and taken up to the third heaven to the judgment of our works. We'll be judged. Every spot has to be taken out of our marriage wedding garment. Every wrinkle... It has to be cleansed perfectly, omission and commission, sins. They have to be justified by the shed blood of the Son of God. And then we'll go into the marriage supper, and there we'll all have on the marriage garment, the wedding garment. And we'll all look alike, because we'll be with him forever and ever and ever and there's not one verse of Scripture anywhere in the Bible that says we ever leave Jesus Christ for one moment when he comes at the time of the rapture of the church. Wherever he goes, we go. He comes down to the earth to reign for a thousand years as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We come with him as ambassadors. He goes to the white throne judgment at the end of the millennial kingdom to judge the wicked of all generations of the earth. We go with him, not to be judged, but we go with him because we are always with him from the time of the translation from then on. We never leave him for one moment.